Okay, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this CEPR sponsored event to mark the launch of the economic history of Central, East and Southeast Europe, 1800 to 1870, uh, a book which is edited by Matthias Morris and published by Routledge. Uh, I'm Steve Broadbury, the director of the CEPR economic history program, and I'm going to be chairing the session. We're going to start with four short presentations, uh, each strictly limited to 10 minutes. Um, which will give you a brief introduction to some of the important themes in the book. And this will then be followed by a 30 minute question and answer session. Um, so um, the first two speakers are going to be Matthias Morris and Tamash Vonjo, who both have chapters in the book. Um, Matthias Morris is a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics at the University of York. He's going to be speaking on long-term patterns of economic growth, retardation and path dependency in Central, East and Southeast Europe. Uh, Tamash Vonjo is our second speaker. Uh, he's an associate professor in the Department of Social and Political Sciences at Bocconi University and a CEPR research fellow. He's going to be presenting on growth under state socialism. Why did Eastern Europe fall behind? That's gonna be followed by um, our two discussants, Tracy Dennison and Olga Popova, who are distinguished experts on the region. Uh, Tracy Dennison is Professor of Social Science History at the California Institute of Technology. She's a leading expert on demographic history, institutions and economic growth, with a particular focus on Russia and Eastern Europe. Olga Popova is a senior researcher in the Department of Economics at the Leibniz Institute for East and Southeast European Studies, Regensburg, and a research associate at Sir GI in Prague. Her main research interests are health and environmental, environmental economics, quality of life, individual and regional inequalities, and economic development with a focus on emerging and transition economies. Uh, that will hopefully all um, be squeezed into 45 minutes at the beginning. And we then have 30 minutes for the Q&A session. You'll notice that the, you have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens uh, where you'll be able to pose questions during the event. Uh, if you see a question there that you like or wished you'd asked um, and want to ask as well, then you can upvote this question so that it gets pushed to the top of the list and we will then try to deal with the most popular questions. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Matthias. Um, over to you now. Uh, does this properly show Nadine? Yes, this looks good. Very good. Okay. So um, a, a warm welcome to, to the book launch of our book on um, e the economic history of Central, East and Southeast Europe. And I think I would like to start my, um, my, um, my introductory um, a little speech here uh, with reference to the painting on the book cover. So this is a painting from 1921 by a Russian avant-garde artist and it shows how ordinary Russian folk try to construct a new planet. That's in fact the title of the painting, try to construct a new world after the, um, uh, uh, after the First World War and of course after the subsequent Russian Civil War. And when I saw the, the energy and the, the optimism of this picture for a first time in a Moscow museum, it reminded me very much of a similarly euphoristic period of Eastern European economic history, which is very much related to my hometown of Berlin. And I think in the early 1990s, we, we again were full of optimism. And I think that optimism was very much captured by um, sort of the concept of convergence and with convergence, I hear mean political convergence. That was a very strong claim by the American political scientist Fukuyama 
And he said all countries, Eastern Europe, they would all converge on the Western liberal democracy. And this political idea found its economic counterpart by a prediction of rapid economic convergence. And in fact, when you look back to contributions of Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Lucas, for instance, uh, he wrote within 30 years, uh, they will have all caught up with Western income levels. Now, we are now three decades later from these transformational changes in Eastern Europe and history hasn't ended and convergence hasn't quite worked out the way uh, we thought it would work three, days, uh, three decades ago. Now, when we look at the political, um, at the political spectrum, we, we, we clearly see that uh, there is a lot of tension both domestically as well as internationally. But perhaps let's focus a bit more on economics here in this, uh, for the purpose of this book. Um, we will give you more detailed numbers later, myself and then Tamash, who will speak on growth during state socialism, but just an impression. So you can travel from Berlin to Ukraine within one day easily by car, but it really is a different world. The per head income difference is factor 20. We find this so difficult to digest that by inclination, we prefer to use the PPP adjusted, but even there, the difference between these two countries, which are close by, remains factor six. Another big challenge that Eastern European countries face is the very substantial population decline. Some of the countries have lost more than 20% of their population since the early 1990s. Many of them are losing more than 1% of population per year. So when I and uh, some like-minded uh, colleagues with an interest in Eastern Europe realized that, we, we, we asked ourselves, is the problem more deep-seated? What do we actually know about the past of Central East and Southeast Europe? How far can we trace back the differences in economic performance between West and East? Have they increased over time? Have they decreased? So that's the kind of the idea behind the book. In short, our goal was to write the first ever quantitative economic history of Eastern Europe. Now the challenges were quite big. A big problem was that the East European countries have a long tradition of country specific historiographies. There's very little comparative work. And if there's comparative work, the chosen region is not Eastern Europe as a whole, but it really is either Central Europe, Eastern Europe, so Southeast Europe. And we try to overcome that by really putting these three regions together in the book. Um, and then of course, there was an absence of quantitative economic history, something which came from the United States in the 1960s and clearly didn't make it through the Iron Curtain. So we also had to work on this quite a bit in the process of this book. The approach of the book can really be summarized in three basic ideas. We treat Eastern Europe as one region. We ask the same set of questions for four distinct historical periods. So we don't exclude anything. Take for example, Greece. Greece has a long tradition of arguing that it is not part of the region. We have just thrown it in and actually found very interesting things by comparing Greece in a regional comparative framework. We ask the big economic history questions, economic growth, economic policy, how integrated were these economies with each other and uh, with the rest of the world. And then of course, we have quite a bit of a focus on population and living standards. And we ask that same set of questions for four time periods. So the basic structure is four times four chapters to which we add an introduction and, uh, and an overview of Eastern Europe before 1800. And that together makes then 18 book chapters. These are the 22 countries we are looking at. It's basically all countries to the east of the German and Italian speaking lands in Europe. Now these countries of course have massively changed 
over time. We start off with four in H100. We are seven by World War I. It goes a bit up and down. And then after 1990, with the, dissolution, with the dismemberment of Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union, the number explodes and we currently stand at 22. It's very difficult to condense a huge book into a few slides, but let me try anyway. One of the key things, and that's also the focus of today's presentation, presentations, is of course, economic growth. And I'm afraid there is a kind of um, um, a bad news. We do not see long run convergence of the East European economies towards, uh, let's say Britain and Germany as the main industrial countries of Western Europe. You see here the Soviet Union in comparison, um, specialists of you in the audience will recognize specific events such as the Russian Civil War, the transformational recession of the early 2000s and so on. But the key thing here is the following, the curves in a long run perspective, the green line does not come closer. The difference does not vanish over time, okay? And you can see here that, that our authors for this particular earlier period Schultz and Cobb see this, they really try to push it back massively, but even in 1840, it's almost the same difference as we have today between Russia on the one hand and then Germany and Britain on the other hand. And that difference is big. It's essentially one third of the level of Britain and Germany in a two century perspective. Good, um, that's the last slide. Let me point out to, to a couple of, 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 of other key findings in this contents. So this is not that we intended it to be, but that's how it turned out quite a bit, a book about path dependency and strong persistence in income levels. One third is kind of the general rule, but there were some top performers. And again, these top performers, they do not really change over time. So the star performer over the past two centuries clearly has been Bohemia and the Czech lands. And since the interwar period, we would, uh, with a little bit less degree of certitude, we would include Slovenia, Latvia, and Estonia to that. So in 1938, we know these regions stand out in Eastern Europe. Fast forward eight decades, these are exactly the countries that today are able to operate the Euro as the first East European countries. So there's a, so sort of the Euro as an example of needing to fulfill certain macroeconomic criteria before you can join. So there's a very, very strong element of persistence in that. The, the third thing we found is that these sub-regions, Central, East and Southeast Europe, they really matter for our understanding. And the Central European countries, the so-called Visegrad countries, they have consistently performed better over the two centuries. Um, again, we didn't start with this idea, but that's how it really turned out. And we think that this is to a considerable degree explained by economic geography, the Central European countries have benefited over the past two centuries from much better market access, a force which has reimposed itself after 1990 in a very clear way, leading to very substantial differences between Central Europe and the rest of Eastern Europe. The book doesn't take a strong stance on institutions versus economic geography, but I think some authors make a question mark behind, ex behind institutional explanations. And the reason for that is simple. Eastern Europe has tried out everything. Any possible economic policy framework available has been applied to Eastern Europe and the gap hasn't narrowed. So we think that institutions are much more endogenous than previously thought, at least for, for these specific countries. Last but not least, um, this has been a very, very big data systematization effort. We tried to look for the same data to answer the same questions for all these countries over two centuries. 
So there really is, is a lot to get uh, uh, if, you, if you want to. And I think in some cases, we haven't been able to, to answer the questions, but we have moved unknown unknowns to known unknowns, countries that we think could have an exciting economic history. And I would like to mention the Baltic countries here in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to Tamás Fonio. Okay. So I hope that everyone can see the presentation. Um, uh, thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thanks to the center for uh, hosting this event for us. Uh, this presentation will focus on economic growth in Eastern Europe uh, in the period after the Second World War. This was the place and the period for one of the great socioeconomic experiments of the 20th century. Uh, it takes up a quarter of our book, um, to which I had the honor of contributing two chapters. Both of them are co-authored with Andrei Markovich uh, from the New Economic School in Moscow. Now, for historians uh, of Eastern Europe, socialism will never go out of fashion. Uh, it's just like the Industrial Revolution in Britain, Nazism in Germany, or the Great Depression in the US. Uh, but it should still matter to economists more generally interested in um, the role of institutions in economic development. Um, in this context, post-war Europe remains an inexhaustible uh, source of case studies uh, for different degrees and forms of state management of the economy. If you take a binary view between East and Western Europe, you see two fundamentally different economic systems evolving that produced divergent development outcomes. Uh, the traditional view uh, on socialist economic development has been the product of a vast literature in economics, mostly written in the 1980s and the early 1990s, which gave a rather pessimistic assessment at first. Uh, neoclassical and comparative economists argued that investment-led growth strategies were bound to run into diminishing returns, that central planning generated a sort of a shortage economy with increasingly inefficient allocation of resources, and as economies became more complex, investment also became less efficient, which led to a growing technological gap between Eastern and advanced Western nations. Now, even though this literature is some 30 years old, but it still resonates in academic writing and informs public opinion on socialist experiments. Average rates of economic growth between 1950 and 1989 show that Eastern Europe was unable to converge to Western levels of economic development and even fell behind further during the last decade of communism. Most importantly, it was consistently falling behind the more peripheral regions of Western Europe. Now we can present this data in a different form, which reveals that Western economies formed a convergence club uh, during the post-war era, which is a very well-known fact in Western economic history, but that Eastern Europe was unable to join this club and therefore unable to uh, turn its relative backwardness into a potential for growth. The earliest growth accounts supported this view as they showed a growing productivity failure for centrally planned economies. The development gap between core and peripheral regions of Europe were very substantial after the end of World War II. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, this roughly 50% share of the labor force engaged in agriculture uh, in the Western and Eastern periphery was roughly the same for Western core economies around 1900. Uh, and if Steve is not gonna correct me, uh, in Britain, this was probably already attained somewhere in the 18th century. So there is a huge development gap. Uh, there is strong convergence during the golden age, uh, but not nearly complete. And from the 1970s onward, this convergence process came to a halt, at least between the West uh, and the East. So we see a pretty clear 
uh, failure uh, or pretty robust picture of growth failure. The question therefore is, uh, do we know something more uh, or what more do we know uh, 30 years uh, after the fall of communism in Eastern Europe? Now, the answer is the quite a lot, but still I only have one slide on this. Uh, I will have to be brief. So foremost, we have a much broader quantitative picture on comparative historical statistics that for many, many countries go back now to the 1870s. This allows us to make comparisons we could not do 30 years ago. Uh, we can show how socialism measures up to other phases of economic development in Eastern Europe. Uh, we can draw comparisons with other regions of the global periphery, and we can give a more accurate periodization of relative growth performance between regions of Europe. Improved access to data on production inputs and improved methods of estimation benefited a series of new or revised socialist growth accounts, including some very recent uh, work on regional development accounts. Now, these studies may look a little boring to a modern economist, but they use the standard toolkit of economic historians and therefore enable the type of comparisons with other regions that we talked about. For economists, it is equally or even more important to highlight new insights from economic theory. The list could be very long here, but in my view, the most consequential are new growth models and the new literature on the developmental state. Uh, they change the way we think about convergence and divergence, by we, I mean economists, and about the role of initial endowments in economic growth in general. And they also question older tenets about the role of economic openness and also the role of different political institutions in successful late development. So if we look at the data, uh, on post-war development, the first thing we have to highlight is that the impact of World War II and the post-war settlement was much more severe in Eastern Europe than elsewhere. Data on GDP per capita do not even reveal the full extent of this shock because in this region, population declined together with GDP. In light of these dire starting conditions, centrally planned economies in Eastern Europe actually performed remarkably well after 1950. At least for nearly three decades, they kept pace with Western industrialized nations during what was their golden age of economic growth. However, in the 1980s, growth came to a virtual standstill and very abruptly so. Uh, new estimates show similar trends for capital accumulation with investment ratios rising consistently until the 1970s and then plummeting after 1980, at least outside the Soviet Union. The same holds for regional comparisons. The golden age witnessed strong convergence between the more and less advanced socialist economies, but we see a full reversal of this trend and massive divergence within the region in the last decade of communism. Now, recent studies explaining these trajectories stress the need to better understanding the historical context and also integrating uh, the new theoretical insights. So here, what we try to argue uh, in line with many of the recently or the surveyed recent literature um, is that uh, World War II and the post-war settlement, and you can say both world wars have an apocalyptic impact on Eastern Europe, much greater than in other parts of the world. Uh, when I talk to economists about the economic consequences of the wars, I usually uh, summarize them in five Ds these are death, destruction, displacement, dislocation, and disintegration. And you can take any of the five, you will see that you need a different scale to measure the impact in Eastern Europe than in most Western countries. The most consequential of these consequences was a gigantic loss of human capital, um, which on the one hand um, created an imperative for state intervention for a much broader scale and for much longer after World War II than uh, under any plausible uh, uh, policy regime, but also in more ways than one limited the growth potential of Eastern Europe for decades to come. History mattered at the start, but also at the end of socialism. Uh, 
even though the global economic crisis of the 1980s emerging after the oil shocks and with the sovereign debt crisis in the aftermath hit uh, the Soviet Union on the one hand and Central and Eastern Europe on the other in different ways, uh, but they contributed very significantly uh, to the growth slowdown that we observe uh, in the statistics. So bottom line, history matters. Uh, as a great economic historian, Joel Mokir said, in economics, history is destiny. Uh, and this destiny was very uh, inauspicious after 1945, where the region was doomed uh, to fall behind uh, Western economies. Uh, you can broaden this uh, thesis for the 20th century as a whole, where the data shows that Eastern Europe always fell behind during and as a consequence of major exogenous shocks, the two world wars, the oil shocks and their aftermath, and also what Matthias already referred to, uh, the return to both interstate and intrastate violence in the region in the early 1990s. The global historical context matters here as well, and this is where I would uh, finish. Uh, when we look at global economic history or the historiography in the last 20 years, the socialist period in Eastern Europe suddenly looks much less unique. Uh, the global growth story for much of the 19th and 20th centuries was a story of divergence and not convergence. Falling behind the West was not unique to Eastern Europe. And it was not unique to the post-war era either. So as Matthias already showed, um, it's a negative but important takeaway for people interested in the region to the extent that relative backwardness characterizes Eastern European economies, it seems to be a persistent phenomenon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and now we have our first discussant, Tracy Dennison. Over to you, Tracy. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm really delighted to be uh, participating in this in this launch event and to share uh, to be sharing my enthusiasm for the project that's resulted in, in this volume. The project represents a kind of symbolic or, or metaphorical reunification of East and West, I think, in that it brings as Matthias said in his introduction, intellectual and methodological approaches to the economic history of, of Eastern Europe that were not widely used before the 1990s. But moreover, I think it's symbolic of partnerships and collaborations between researchers uh, from West and from, from East, many of which were formed long ago and have been sustained over many years and have resulted in the kind of work represented in uh, the book that we're here to launch. These collaborations have made enormous contributions to our understanding of the economic history of Central and Eastern Europe, one that's far too large uh, to do justice to in, in 10 minutes. Since Matthias's comments were of a, of a general introductory nature, um, kind of an overview of the volume and the, the issues addressed by the contributors, my comments are going to be of a more general nature uh, as well. Um, I have only three, three slides, um, and I, I want to make three points about the contribution of this new volume related to and building on some of the things Matthias touched on, but adding uh, the perspective of the historians. I'm, I'm a historian, and the relevance of this work to the kinds of questions um, that historians are interested in. So to, to stick with the, uh, <laughs> the analogies being used here um, and, and, and Matthias's photo at the beginning, while the, the, the wall between East and West Germany and Eastern and Western Europe uh, was coming down, the metaphorical wall between history and, and quantitative social science was perhaps growing ever higher. And uh, in the context of research on, on Eastern Europe, um, even higher than previously, I would say. As part of um, what I might call an ever dwindling border community between these two, 
I, I tend to see the, the approaches as more complementary than, than antagonistic. And I think that this volume really speaks to that complementarity. And I mean that in two specific ways. Specific ways. First, I think there can be a really productive feedback loop between history and quantitative social science, where, say, historical research identifies some phenomenon um, that appears to have an economic um, effect, some impact on an economic outcome. So if I were to, to um, give an exa concrete example of this, uh, say historical research highlights expropriation of peasant land by, by nobles or noble land by monarchs repeatedly. And a social scientist might then devise a set of measures that helps to quantify the risk of expropriation of land over time or across a region or a set of countries. And these more specific more precise quantitative indicators might tell us that this expropriation was more pronounced in a certain time period among certain groups uh, in certain regions. The historian might then use that finding to go back to the archive, to look at court records, land transfer documents, and to link those to existing narratives of political conflict, for instance, and, and so on um, in, a, in a process whereby the work of each group helps the other to refine and reformulate questions for research. And I think this volume is incredibly valuable for historical researchers as it sets quantitative parameters uh, and baselines for a wide range of variables and outcomes that will guide future research programs in both history and quantitative economic history in, in this region. Second, I think that the region is one where the potential for cross-disciplinary collaboration is, is immense. There's a long tradition of those doing work in politics and political science or economics of Eastern Europe um, in engaging with historical scholarship. And the fact that in the Soviet period, in the Soviet bloc, it was so difficult to disentangle politics and economics and society that this kind of more holistic approach to social science has been the norm. But, but more concretely, I want to point out two ways in which this volume um, in quantitative, this work in quantitative economic history will help to guide future research in this region. The first has to do with exploring variation within the regions. So um, the emphasis in the framing of the volume and in, in Matthias's comments today um, has, has been about you know, how we think about Eastern Europe and these regions within regions um, and how we need to distinguish those in order to try and better understand what's, what's going on. And, and this, makes a lot of, this makes a lot of sense historically and for the reasons mentioned by Matthias and from an economic geography standpoint. But of course, these regions are always defined relative to other regions. So they're based on some identified similarities. Um, often, and in this case, the, the, the comparator is, is Western Europe or Northwest Europe. And there are always trade-offs involved in choosing one regional entity over uh, another. Europe has been an incredibly heterogeneous place for a long time. Um, this is true of, of Western Europe and Northwest Europe, which we tend to treat as, as groups as well. Um, and it makes sense, I think, to use these regional categories for larger comparative purposes like the ones um, that are, are, are being addressed in this volume, but it's also, important to remember that these countries were significantly different from one another in important ways. And one of the great things about this book is that while it's organized temporally and the chapters are thematic within a, a chronological context, each one does provide indicators at the specific country level so that one gets a sense of the variation in outcomes within, uh, within a region, whether it's Central Europe or Southeast Europe um, over a certain time period. And that means one can really focus in on questions about why some, why some countries had significantly higher standards of living than other nearby places, or why agricultural productivity seemed to be somewhat better in one place um, as uh, when compared to the place next door, um, why urbanization uh, 
grew faster. And again, it's all relative, but grew faster in some places than others. So I think it's a really great springboard for asking questions about um, what specific features a region shares and where we see intra-regional divergence and why we see that. And finally, and this is the one I'll have a little bit more to say about, um, and it relates to Matthias's comment about um, institutions. And so uh, that is, of course, something I would want to spend a little time talking about. I think that um, the what the contributors to this volume have done in setting out certain quantitative, um, certain quantitative indices, benchmarks, giving us a sense, a quantitative sense of differentiation across regions within regions, can help us better think about larger explanations that might have affected economic growth and development in the long, long run. So this question of persistence well before uh, 1800. All of these, um, all of these places, and I want to focus on three, three things. There are a number of things one could choose, but I'm going to focus on three things that relate to the question of institutions and um, ways in which the countries within these regions might have differed in ways that were important. Um, they go from sort of macro to micro, starting with the political economy of empire. Um, just, you know, many of these parts of Europe were themselves parts of larger political entities. So um, Poland, Lithuania, the Holy Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, Sweden, Prussia, uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire later. It, it wasn't only the boundaries that changed with remarkable frequency, but the governing frameworks. And those changes that occurred implied changes in the seat of power, um, the forms and frequency of taxation, um, how different governments, how different empires governed their territories, their level of involvement in local affairs, and so on. Um, we know that in many of these places there were, there were overlapping systems of government, and that, that in itself is something we want to think a little bit harder about, and I think that the uh, these quantitative measures, as I mentioned before, can help us really kind of focus in on where we see there are differences to be explained. And could we take those back to questions about the larger structures of governance in these, in these societies? The next is serfdom. Um, Matthias mentioned uh, in, in, in the list of, of institutions that um, that had sort of appeared and disappeared in this part of Europe in feudalism. And I think it's important to recognize that there really wasn't such a thing as feudalism as a monolithic category. So parts of this region were characterized by serfdom. Other parts were not at all. Um, Russia, in the, the historiography of Russia, it said that Russia was bogged down in the long run by serfdom. But then why weren't Prussia, the Habsburg territories, uh, affected in the same way in the long run. Serfdom varied enormously from place to place. Um, it varied in terms of the strength of landlords' powers, peasants' rights, their rights to property, um, their rights to access civic institutions, um, state enforcement of, of serfdom. Um, taxation, conscription, these sorts of things. And even superficially, we have places with serfdom, like the Baltic territories, parts of Poland, uh, where the serfs and the landowning elites are not only members of different social groups, but different cultural and linguistic groups. So German landowning class with Polish or Latvian or Czech serfs. And I think, again, these are bigger questions that the uh, that, that, that this volume in its identifying patterns within these subregions can help us 
better addressed, focus in on, say, oh, you know, do, well, these are the places that had no serfdom, and do they share these features? These are the places that did, hmm, but they look very different. Maybe it was something about the forms of serfdom that was different. And, and the last is, is, these are all related, as you can see, but the last is, um, I guess, drilling down a bit further to the question of local corporative entities or these institutions at the micro level. And again, going back to uh, the question of, of political economy of empire and the kinds of negotiations that occurred, um, how a, an imperial government allowed uh, local entities to operate. So was there variation in privileges of towns, for instance, of noble landlords, of guilds, of merchant groups, um, peasant communities had different rights, had different privileges, had different obligations across this ter territory. And I think we, we, we might want to um, look at the differences and similarities that have emerged from these studies of these three different subregions and try to refine our questions about these particular entities and ask ourselves whether, um, whether the differences observed or the similarities might be rooted in similarities or differences related to these kinds of questions. In short, I, I guess I would say the formulation of these precise questions about economic growth and development in this region over, um, over two centuries, the use of, of new data and methodologies, and the range of, of outcomes uh, presented are, are really of enormous benefit to the field as a whole, even beyond quantitative economic history. I think there's a very wide audience for this book. And all of this really speaks to, I, I think, the quality of the, the collaborative efforts of this, of this particular group of researchers. So I will, I will end with a thanks and a congratulations to all those involved in the project. Uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, our last discussant is Olga Popova. So I'll hand over to you, Olga. Thank you, Steve, for, for, the, for the nice introduction and uh, Matthias for inviting me to join this uh, event. Uh, my comments would go very much in line with the uh, book chapter that uh, Tamás uh, Vonio and Andrei Markevich have written, one of the ch their chapters, which is focused on the economic growth and the structural developments in the post-war period. And here I would like to start with uh, congratulating all the authors of this book and uh, Matthias on the uh, wonderful collection of ideas about the region and about com comparative perspective of, of these regions with, with the rest of the Europe. So generally the chapter looks into the uh, different things. It looks into the uh, aggregate growth uh, in the region, into the structural developments and industrial developments in the region, and also on the investment patterns in the Central East and Southeast European countries. Uh, the, the focus of the chapter is on the cross-country differences in, in the, the, the trajectories of these uh, indicators. And what I like especially about the chapter is uh, uh, several comparative perspectives that uh, it underscores. It is talking to the uh, region and comparing the region to Western Europe, both core and periphery countries. It uh, talks to the Soviet Union and uh, compares it with the rest of the Central East and Southeast Europe as a whole, as a region, and also looks into the within country, uh, within region differences between, between these countries. The, Chapter is generally uh, structured into uh, four uh, major parts. Uh, as Tamasho also mentioned, uh, the authors start with uh, describing the initial conditions of, the, of this period. We start with the uh, afterwar period and the, all its consequences. Uh, then the authors talk about the aggregate growth patterns, the structural developments and the capital accumulation. Uh, what is 
the biggest challenge and what what authors uh, successfully overcome is the data com comparability issues and they uh, provide a nice contribution on uh, collecting a set of indicators on the GDP, on the industrial shares and on the uh, investment patterns in the region and give us, give us food for thought for, for the further analysis of these uh, issues. As Tamash also mentioned, this is the very interesting period. It is, it is comprising both the uh, economic growth, which, is, which was quite substantial, and also the relative economic decline. What we can underscore and what we can learn from this chapter is that uh, even though this, uh, this was uh, high economic growth rate over this period in the region, uh, the region still lagged behind uh, the uh, Western European countries in the same period. And what we also learn is that uh, the, this is a period of uh, substantial Structural modernization in the uh, in the region, which was industry driven, and what is also interesting is the growth in the female labor participation that uh, helped to facilitate the, this economic growth. What I see are the main uh, contributions of this chapter. Uh, first, it is the comparative perspectives that I have already mentioned. It uh, gives us uh, more food for thought uh, about relevant benchmarks to compare the region of Central East and Southeast Europe uh, and the, the regions uh, within Europe. Uh, then it is of course about the uh, uh, systematization of the data. And this is true of course for the whole book. It provides us with a comparable uh, overview of the indicators and the analysis of the patterns of economic growth sectoral developments and the investment rates, and also refers the reader to the relevant literature about these indicators. And more generally, and I agree with this pattern, uh, with this conclusion, the authors argue that uh, this period of the post-war period specifically explain the, explains the root causes of the many challenges that we observe in the region today. And uh, this goes very much in line with the persistent literature, emerging persistent literature on the, on the region. Here I could also mention a couple of my own studies uh, where we look into, uh, for example, the legacy of the uh, forced uh, labor camps on the contemporary within country differences in trust in, in this region or the all in other paper we look on the legacy of communist party membership on current day entrepreneurship. More broadly, the chapter uh, provides a very nice overview on economic growth and sectoral developments in the Central East and Southeast U European countries in the post-war period. And it inspires us uh, to look more deeply into this period and the, uh, the consequences of this period, particularly what is related to the economic policies that accompany these growth and uh, their consequences, for example, for labor market, human capital, for the technological development of the region, for environmental qualities or income inequalities. The chapter generally highlights a lot of differences and it speaks very nicely also to the other chapters in the book that uh, some of them also speak about the economic integration. So overall, the book gives us a very comprehensive view on the development of the region and uh, gives us a lot of food for thought for the, uh, for the analysis of this, uh, this region and their uh, development. Uh, I would like to finish my comments here and congratulate the authors on the uh, very nice contribution. And I look forward to the discussion of the, our uh, presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Olga. You've uh, actually finished ahead of time. So that's, <laughs> good. that's brought us um, back, not quite on time, but um, we now move on to the question and answer session. I want to start by saying that um, there probably won't be time to answer all the questions um, live in, in discussion today, but um, Matthias has assured me that uh, he will try to arrange that the questions are answered via uh, email or 
or some other method to it <coughs> in, in the subsequent days. Um, so um, we're going to start, I think, with the question that was asked by Peter, Peter Stein. Um, he asks, uh, it may be true that Eastern Europe has tried everything, but not every Eastern European country has tried everything. Estonia has tried liberal capitalism, others have not. Is there a risk that your approach overlooks key roles played by individuals making policy choices? Uh, and I'm going to ask um, Laszlo Saba to answer that one. Laszlo. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm perhaps in uh, so often in the minority of a group of scholars who have a more mainstream view of developments, which has been very neatly explained by Matthias and also by Tomás, namely that somehow the factors of production uh, explain uh, development in the long run. Furthermore, there is a deterministic reading of path dependence. Now, having been involved in, in many of the reforms, successful and unsuccessful reforms over the past 35 years, I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, the statement involved in the question that the, the role of individuals and the role of values matter a lot. Uh, individuals in the sense that you always need somebody who is actually start the ball rolling and when the ball is rolling then it's pushing in, into the right, uh, into the right uh, uh, place. Uh, and also the values uh, matter a lot. I mean, in the case of Estonia, we have a very, very clear case in which uh, the elite of the country wanted to make a clear uh, discontinuity with the Soviet period. They wanted to revive uh, real or perceived uh, interrelationship to Estonia being uh, somehow in the heritage of the Hanseatic lead. And therefore uh, they were willing to introduce reforms that were not possible in other countries. Furthermore, when uh, the real test of the time uh, emerged uh, during the uh, Great Recession 2007-2009, they were willing to conduct a set of policies uh, which uh, were not feasible in other countries. I mean, if anybody would have started half of the type of adjustment policies that were introduced by the Estonian and also by the Latvian government um, in a country like France uh, or let alone Italy. Uh, I mean, those governments would have been uh, encountering uh, popular uprising uh, to say the least. By contrast, in the case of Estonia and Latvia, uh, we see that the values of the elite and also the willingness to, uh, of individuals uh, to conduct uh, the policies which were actually harsher than the policies advocated by the international uh, agencies did pay off because those countries, although have gone through a deep recession for a year, uh, and uh, they were coming up and have been uh, continuing both growth and structural modernization uh, to the point that today Estonia, the one-time periphery of the Russian Empire is the envy of many countries in terms of using information technology and many, many other modern form of, uh, of uh, economic management. So in short, I think it is a very important issue. And when we are about to explain what is happening uh, in individual countries, including my own country, Hungary, obviously the personality of the leadership uh, and the top leaders uh, is... Uh, highly relevant, nobody would uh, dispute away uh, the relevance uh, of the work of Joja Fanta, the prime minister who died in 1993 in creating peaceful conditions of uh, transition to democracy and the market economy. And nobody would doubt the relevance of the personality of Viktor Orban uh, to introduce something which is generally referred to as illiberal capital capitalism uh, in this country. So I would agree very much with the comment uh, formulated uh, in the question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question has been asked by Svetin Chukanov. Uh, 
Um, he asks, uh, do you have a forecast regarding the economic future of the region? And um, this is one for Giral Kosev. Thank you very much. I, I hope that the sound is uh, is on and you can hear hear well. Well, I th this is an interesting question because, uh, as we know, uh, observers often look at historical trends to discuss the future, and I think that's one of the uh, values of this of this volume. Well, in our chapter on internationalization in the region since 1989. We don't provide a quantitative forecast because that was not the spirit of the publication. But what we do provide is a, a couple of interesting observations related to its economic future. So one is that opening up to the global market economy has been an overwhelming trend across the majority of uh, the countries in the region that we discussed since uh, 1989. Uh, also looking to develop domestic market uh, economies and the relevant uh, institutional setting. And I would say a third observation is that no real attempt at reversing this trend has, uh, has been observed so far, despite some different trends in terms of political economy. And we heard a little bit in the previous comments. So I think these three observations tell us that we could be a little bit optimistic for the immediate, uh, if you like, even the medium term economic future in terms of growth, in terms of uh, technology adoption, and, and, and knowledge exchange within this uh, globalized world economy that uh, we are all finding it, it's, uh, each other now. But uh, there's also an important caveat that uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Southeast Europe, Central Europe, and uh, the entire region is now fully synced also to the economic volatility of the globalized market economy. So uh, in this sense, uh, looking at uh, future growth and future knowledge exchanges, we should be optimistic, but we should not discount that uh, there is no longer the sort of economic breaks of uh, global crisis uh, spilling over. So this is what I would uh, say about the, the future. Thank you. Uh, we had a question, um, asked, someone asked them, why is Greece included? Um, um, I'm afraid I can't find it on the many uh, questions we have, but uh, Matthias has volunteered to answer that one. Matthias. Yes, so, so, so thank you for that question. Um, what countries we, we, we include or exclude was quite a bit of a discussion as part of that project. And eventually we decided to really basically include everything in Eastern Europe, east of the German and Italian speaking lands. And Greece, that's why I mentioned the case, is, is particularly interesting because there's a very strong historiographical tradition in, in Greece to really not see itself as part of the region. And we, 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 we simply try to say, Let's include it. Let's see what the data say. Let's see how the country actually compares to the other 21 or how many ever they were in the different periods. And I think we have really interesting finding in the books. And as far as Greece is concerned, the main finding is that the country in the 19th century and really into the interwar period follows a very standard regional pattern. And yes, of course, after World War II, the country takes on a very different trajectory simply because it is the only Central East and Southeast European country that does not undergo the state socialist experience. But here's the thing, that exactly makes it such a wonderful point of comparison to the other countries. And you can really read off from simple summary statistics, if you will, the growth penalty of the state socialist experience by comparing growth rates of Yugoslavia or Bulgaria, other countries that Greece was basically. Oh, I've lost the sound there. I think Matthias has frozen. Um, I think we better move on to another question. Um, So um, um, Hannah Ross asks, um, GDP is a disputed measure. Can these economies be compared using a different metric? And that 
This one I've been told is for Max. Max, can you? Yes, so, sorry, I, I heard you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Uh, okay. Um, well, in an ideal world, yes, but unfortunately we do not live in an ideal world and we have to work with what uh, the sources allow us to do. Uh, the question is whether there were alternative, perhaps more useful indicators to compare what happened to the economies of the regions. I think when it comes to measures that are actually comparable across time and across space, it is very difficult to find anything other than, of course, the building blocks included in the construction of GDP measures per se. But we could, for instance, look at um, employment shares and the structure of employment, which is particularly useful because it reveals what we believe is one of the fundamental problems that the region as a whole was characterized with by, if, however, to different degrees. One of the key findings, if we look at the economic history of the region up to the First World War, was that the performance gap, the income gap, the productivity gap vis-a-vis -vis Western Europe did not narrow, but rather it widened. And one of the questions then is why may that, why was that the case? The first argument we would use is that it is in essence an outcome not of some inherent relative or backwardness per se, but ironically, to at least to some extent, an outcome also of the peculiar way that the region was becoming increasingly integrated in the international economy as a main provider of food, which in turn had one effect in a region where the demographic transition had not yet taken place and where capital was relatively scarce, that uh, there was always a positive population response to the exogenous shock of an increase in demand for foodstuffs. So to cut a long story short, one of the big problems, and that is on the basis of the data that we have is distinct from GDP comparable across the region, that uh, population growth remained high and uh, it remained high, A, because the demographic transition per se had not happened yet, but it was also beneficial in the sense that it allowed the region to respond elastically to the increase in demand for foodstuffs. And that was then a response that took the shape, first of all, simply to increase agricultural output, but also to expand uh, the lands farmed in Eastern Europe in particular. The effect of that, we would reckon is that uh, a much larger proportion of the population was effectively held on the land. Now that in turn meant that the scope for productivity growth relative say to uh, uh, Western Europe and Northern Europe was far more limited yeah, where a much larger proportion of overall output was generated in industry and manufacturing. So we have two problems. A, that the initial size of the secondary sector was very low in Eastern uh, and Central Europe compared to the West. And B, that structural change was so slow. But that was not per se and only a response to specific conditions in Eastern Europe, but also a response to the opening up of the international economy to the rural or agricultural economies of Eastern Europe. So to revert back, to uh, the question, yes, there may be some other measures that we could use, but they would not tell us, I believe, a very different story. We have evidence on uh, uh, life expectancy, at least for the late 19th century. We have evidence on schooling. All of these are, of course, endogenously related to relative income levels. But I think whatever available indicator we choose, it would not tell a story, at least for the period up to the First World War, that would uh, suggest a far more optimistic interpretation of the course that the economies of Eastern 
uh, and Central and Southeastern Europe took. So I think GDP is probably the one composite measure that allows for the highest possible degree, however low it is, uh, of assessing comparative performance. But it would not, the picture is unlikely to alter substantially if we were to have better data when it came to education or whether it came to uh, life expectancy, for instance. Okay, thank you, Max. Uh, we have um, a question from Yaman Cooley saying, uh, in his recent publication, uh, Marcin Piotrowski enthusiastically draws a picture of Poland being Europe's growth champion since 1994. According to him, Poland's current institutional setup nurtures the hope that Poland will catch up to Western Europe during the next decades. Matthias, on the other hand, emphasized that the difference in productivity between CEE and Western Europe has proven to be very persistent. Would you still follow Piotrowski in his optimism or are you more careful or pessimistic as to whether CEE in general or Poland in particular will be able to escape the middle income trap and reach Western European productivity levels? So that's one for you, Matthias. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm sorry for dropping out earlier. So here I'm back. Um, well, I think that uh, first of all, it, it's very important to, to use that word middle income trap. Um, most of the countries in the region are middle-income countries by now, and they might face exactly that trap. And the question is whether they can escape it. I think as far as uh, Poland is concerned, the country has had a very good growth performance uh, since the mid-1990s, since leaving the transformational recession. It was one of the countries in Europe least affected by the financial crisis of 2008. And I think the convergence process in the Polish case um, has, broadly speaking, continued. So I'm quite optimistic about Poland, as I would be quite optimistic about most of the Visegrad countries. Thank you. Uh, nice brief answer there. Um, next question I have is from Sheila Ogilvy. Um, Sheila asks, um, the book presents fascinating work showing the long historical persistence of lower growth in Eastern and Western Europe, but I wonder if it is wholly justified to conclude that persistence implies that the explanation is geography rather than institutions. Although geography is persistent, so too are institutions. Behind the facade of serfdom lay a variety of different institutional arrangements in different parts of Eastern Europe. Even when serfdom was abolished, it was often replaced by new extractive institutions which derived from the past. I wonder if the implication of this volume is that we now know what we need to explain and we need to delve much more deeply into the causal mechanisms and the relative importance of geography, institutions and other factors. I'm going to um, randomly assign that one to Mikolai Malinowski. If you would, Mikolai, do you have any views on that? Um, I think this is a very, very important topic to raise that uh, mm, Indeed, there's always the three. There's markets, institutions, and geography. And we have well, institutional fundamentalists, geographical fundamentalists, and people that focus on uh, classical theory to explain economic performance. I think the strength of economic history is to really understand the historical mechanisms via which those different um, uh, forces interact. And I think exactly the maybe turbulent history of Eastern Europe, the fact that there were different institutional setups interacting with geography is an opportunity to test exactly under what conditions which institutional setup uh, interacts with geography. So I would, uh, I absolutely agree that it is a challenge. It's a question that has not been answered yet, but it's exactly one of this known unknowns now well, that invites future research that I hope this book is going to inspire future generations of economic historians to pursue. Thank you. Uh, I'll move on now to the question from Jorge Duran. Um, he asks, um, if the war shocks explain the poor performance of the Soviet bloc, what explains the stagnation of life expectancy in the late 60s and of production in the late 70s? And let me try Andre Markovic for that one. 
Any thoughts, Andre? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's indeed quite an important question. Uh, well, uh, there are several reasons uh, for that, and they are debated in the literature. Uh, so, Tamas highlighted uh, in his in his presentation. Tamas highlighted external shocks which affected the region, especially oil shock, because we usually think about the Soviet Union as oil exporter, but the other countries in the Eastern Europe in, in the Eastern Europe were oil importers, and uh, this was quite a substantial shock for them. But uh, of course, ex ex except except these reasons, I would like uh, the stand the, the the another explanation for which uh, there are various evidence uh, is related to technological uh, technological growth and the total factor productivity growth in the region, uh, which uh, was a bit problematic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from Albrecht Ritchell. How about conditional convergence? Would anything other than country fixed effects play a role? Um, I think that's surely uh, tailor made for Tamash to um, respond to. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, a brilliant question, really. Um, not so easy to answer because, first, it depends on uh, how one wants to define. Um, conditional convergence. So the easiest way to test this, and some of us have done so, is just to take the solo approach, right? So convergence controlling for the traditional solo controls, uh, so investment ratios, uh, human capital accumulation, and so on. Um, and if we do so, then um, uh, we actually see the, the same picture that uh, we see just by eyeballing uh, uh, growth levels that uh, if we, let's say, uh, run a standard uh, growth regression for post-war Europe, then we don't really see um, uh, a unique um, a component for socialist countries in Eastern Europe until uh, the late 1970s, but a very big one in the 1980s. So once again, we have this problem, easily explainable performance until the 1970s, and then some big shock in the 1980s that uh, uh, we need something else to explain. Now, of course, as economic historians, we know conditional convergence more from the work of Abramovitz uh, and others in the 1980s uh, or from the canonical work of Hall and Jones. And uh, here we always think about social capabilities or the social structure of an economy. And these things include so many uh, uh, factors, including institutions, that once we start talking about conditional convergence in this framework, we are basically back to institutions, aren't we? So, um, I think it's more difficult to test, and this is why I'm trying to emphasize that uh, the next step uh, in terms of analyzing uh, economic growth in Eastern Europe would be to think of ways of testing more directly the newer theories of growth emerging from the 1990s, uh, whether it's endogenous uh, technological change or uh, technology skill complementarities or skill and capital bias technical change, uh, especially because with Römer's uh, Nobel Prize in economics two years ago, this kind of has been accepted as the new mainstream uh, uh, in growth theory, right? And uh, of course, it's a major challenge. Uh, those of us who study economic growth in history, we know that these new theories are present massive challenges uh, if, if we want to test them with historical data, uh, add to that the data problems in Eastern Europe, but at least we need to uh, start thinking about uh, economic growth in a comparative perspective in light of these new theories, because if you talk to the proponents of these new theories, macroeconomists today, they think very differently about questions of convergence. You know, they often, when I talk to these people, they often ask me, why do you expect that there should be convergence, right? The theories that we have learned in the last 10, 15 years say that there is not necessarily convergence, that it's very difficult to converge. Um, and I think this is where, uh, as I said, the next step would be to try to um, bring Eastern Europe uh, into the discussion also in the context of uh, these uh, post-solo or post-extended solo models. Thank you. Okay, I think we're out of time now. So um, I think we're going to have to bring this to a close. Let me just take the opportunity to 
thank Matthias and the rest of the panel, and also to thank all you participants. It's been a very interesting session. Um, I think Matthias is going to try to arrange for answers to be given to the other questions that we haven't been able to uh, address in this live session uh, over the next few days. So thanks again to everyone for coming and goodbye.